Welcome to The Gary Null Show, a program designed to enhance mental, physical, and spiritual well-being through science and the wisdom of the ages. Let us take you on a journey of empowerment. Sit back, relax, and get ready to change your life for good. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. Once again, taking you on a journey of wellness, except this journey is going to take you all over the world. And we're going to explore a major controversy. And the controversy is this. Is HIV the cause of AIDS? Is the antibody test accurate? Are the drugs that are meant to treat it actually causing people to die? These are very important questions that many people believe have not been accurately or honestly answered by the people leading the war on on AIDS. Many are saying that we have another medical Vietnam. We failed in the war on cancer, we have failed in the war on AIDS. Join me now as we explore these issues in deconstructing the myth of AIDS. Many believe that thousands of people have died, not because of an HIV virus, but because of the medications aggressively given in otherwise healthy asymptomatic individuals. Think about uh, Septrim, you know. The FDA says this should be given only a 14 days maximum. Otherwise, your own blood, blood picture is going to be destroyed irreversibly, means for the rest of the life because the damages became inherited. Because it's septrim, it's pure chemotherapy, it acts on a genetic level. This is why those kind of antibiotics are so effective, because they are destroying the genetic material of the bacteria. The damages are accumulating and there is no repair. But the damages are accumulating inside our cells as well. And therefore, this is the reason why AIDS is of greatest importance to everybody but out of completely different reason. Because humankind is in danger to destroy its own genetic material using this kind of antibiotica and chemotherapy, which would destroy the genetic material of our mitochondria. This is the name of those bacteria inside our cell producing the energy. And then we go lower and lower with energy production. And this is what we are seeing. And if we then have no regenerative power, um, then it, it becomes a big, big problem. I've done most of my work on ACT, which uh, was first started being prescribed in 1987. And that's a long story, but I've shown that the uh, original drug trials, the phase two studies, were blatantly fraudulent, proving nothing. And yet it was the basis for the approval of ACT, not only in the, the United States, uh, but 30 other countries. During the three years that I participated in the early AZT clinical trials, I witnessed the most shocking, unethical, unscientific, and corrupt behavior by the clinicians conducting the studies. For anyone who believes that AZT was proven to be safe or effective, I would never claim that based on the results of the studies that I participated in. Whenever there was an adverse reaction or something that could have been an adverse reaction to the experimental drug, this information was supposed to have been recorded on an as-needed form. Some kind of a adverse reaction such as diarrhea or weight loss or night sweats or vomiting or fevers or the development of an opportunistic infection, often these things were not recorded. And so how would you really know if there were adverse reactions to these drugs if they were routinely left out of the data? It was often the case that patients would not even be asked to sign informed consent forms, or often that they were asked to sign these forms weeks or even months after they had been enrolled on the study. There were many patients who developed blood toxicities there were many patients who experienced other symptoms 
of adverse reactions. And think of all the people today who are still taking AZT. Think of all the people who died from uh, what we think was AIDS. Were those people, in fact, killed by AZT? After 87 uh, cancer of the lymph system, which is directly caused by AZT and that has been studied in the 60s and that has been the reason why ACT has been forbidden since then in animals because uh, it uh, killed all of them and caused uh, uh, cancer of the lymphatic system before. Glaxo welcomes inserts to the physicians and the physician's desk reference, warns the doctors not to confuse the toxic effects of AZT with, with AIDS itself. AZT causes numerous AIDS-defining diseases. For example, AZT causes dementia, which is AIDS-defining. AZT causes diarrhea. AZT causes muscle wasting. It causes a whole host of, of complications. It destroys the bone marrow, requiring life-saving blood transfusions of people that use AZT. This information you get from Glaxo Welcome itself, the manufacturer. So I don't know who better else to go to. The antiviral drugs are chemotherapies. They're all based on chemotherapies that have been developed 30 years ago, long before AIDS was known to, to, to kill human cells, to kill cancer cells. Hopefully, that's the operating principle of chemotherapy. You kill all growing cells. You want to kill cancer cells, but you have to kill all growing cells because you work with a so-called DNA chain terminator, a substance that terminates the synthesis of the central molecule of life, that is DNA. And then that is terminated, adios cell. The cell is going to die, and sooner or later, you're going to die. Chemotherapy is restricted to humans in the hope the cancer dies before you die. That's why it has to be restricted. But antiviral therapy, a chemotherapy now used for the first time in the history, again, of virology, never mind the extremely detrimental effect to human cells. Not accidental, not side effects the designer effects on human cells. These are chemotherapies designed to kill human cells. What if you were to take completely healthy individuals who had no risk factors for depressing their immune system and every day, four times a day, you give them one of the most toxic chemotherapy drugs ever created, AZT. What would you imagine would be the state of their immune system and overall health within two years? And yet that's exactly what has been done with many people who have tested positive for the HIV antibody. 1987 was the year that there was a big rise in the mortality rates of HIV positive hemophiliacs. 1987 was also the year that AZT was introduced as a therapeutic for uh, AIDS and also uh, administered to hemophiliacs that were HIV positive. And I'm pretty convinced that the rise in the mortality of these hemophiliacs is a direct consequence of the toxic effects of the AZT. AZT was so toxic in the 1960s that it was never used in humans. In fact, it was so toxic it was considered worthless. That's why they didn't even patent it. I'm also concerned with the growing number of states that are passing laws requiring pregnant women to be tested for antibodies to HIV. Following the passage of these laws, it's a short step to compelling or intimidating these women to take these poisons and also to give these poisons to their babies. When a woman is pregnant in this country, she's told not to be around cigarette smoke, drink coffee, alcohol, yet we're telling a woman who tests positive on a nonspecific test for antibodies that may or may not have anything to do with HIV, that the only reasonable response is to take a drug that terminates DNA chains as they're forming, that causes immune suppression, anemia, seizures, muscle wasting, that causes damage to the mitochondria of the cells, that has been shown to produce infants with incredibly horrible birth defects ranging from webbed fingers to misshapen heads to holes in their chest to mental retardation. This is wrong. Women who test HIV positive and are pregnant 
are having their children taken away from them or being threatened with loss of custody if they don't comply with what the Centers for Disease Control acknowledges are recommendations for therapy and protocols. Testing HIV positive when you're pregnant can be simply a result of being pregnant. One of the first cross-reactions on HIV tests that were ever noted was pregnancy itself. You have a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more people are treated against AIDS, the more people will eventually develop AIDS from it. And then the perfect excuse is delivered with the medication. You can say, Jesus, if I hadn't medicated you, you would have been sick even sooner and would have died sooner. But thanks to my medication, you are only getting sick now and we're giving you even more medication. We need more money to develop further medications that have yet to cure the first AIDS patients. The old paradigm in science is first you find the cause and then you treat the cause. Well, with AIDS, we have violated both. We have assumed the cause, have never proved it. We have assumed it was infectious. We have assumed among all infectious agents this virus does it. We have been unable to prove it. And we have cured and cured and cured against this virus with the result of 600,000 patients, 350,000 dead, and not a single cure in sight. We are claiming more and more money to continue the same vicious cycle. Who really benefits from the billions upon billions of dollars spent each year on AIDS research? Those that control and maintain the HIV hypothesis of AIDS are two basic institutions, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Both of these institutions will probably come as a surprise to the public to learn that they are military organizations. It was certainly a surprise to me to learn this. The leaders of the National Institutes of Health and the CDC uh, have uniforms. They have military ranks. And as everybody who's ever been in the military knows, there's an information flow from top to bottom. Military structures are incompatible with free and open discourse and debate, which is supposed to be what science is about. When you have these military structures in the CDC and the National Institutes of Health, you can control the debate. You can control the information flow. Not only that, since the National Institutes of Health are the primary source of funding for all academic, medical, scientific research, they can control who gets funding to do what research. And in that fashion, they can control what gets published and more importantly, what you exclude. For more than 15 years, the American public have been told that the HIV virus is the sole cause of AIDS. Those members of the scientific community who have questioned this dogma, the three-part equation HIV equals AIDS and equals death, have been suppressed. Peter Duisberg at the University of California Berkeley campus is seen, as is often done with maverick uh, scientists or others, uh, as someone who is now dangerous. This is uh, typically the way uh, such mavericks are treated. Uh, his funding has been cut off. Uh, graduate students are in, encouraged not to take his courses, and I think his administrative duties have included uh, uh, being in charge of the department picnic. Uh, this is a brilliant scientist who should be and is at the height of his powers, and he has not been treated as one would expect of one, uh, a brilliant scientist, and two, a supposedly liberal campus like the University of California at Berkeley. Peter is a very scholarly person in addition to being brilliant too. He's very careful. He doesn't say anything that he can't support. And also the most, one of the most brilliant people in, uh, surely the most brilliant virologist, possibly the most brilliant you know, molecular biologist around. He was a really well thought of guy too because of his ideas, the whole field. I mean, in, in cancer, he's the guy that led him into the whole oncogene thing, you know? Big research bonanza. Anybody who could order a little kit from some company and, and hire a couple of technicians could be a cancer researcher. 
because of, of things that Peter opened up. And then Peter said, no, I don't think that's actually the cause of cancer. And that made those guys a little bit angry. And then he comes along and does the same thing for AIDS. He says, you know, I think we're on the wrong track here. And for some reason, you know, the second time, it was almost like nobody even had to argue with him. Oh, it's just Peter again, ruining our fun, telling us that all this easy research stuff that we, we know we can do now for years and the American people will pay for it, uh, that, we can't, we're not, that we shouldn't be doing that. And Peter did that again. He did that twice. We need a lot more Peters. you check the first uh, publications on AIDS and you will see that we have five young men. All of them had uh, the use of nitrites reported and those nitrites were used for sexual stimulation but they are very dangerous. They are oxidizing the blood and if the blood is oxidized no energy is produced inside the body because we need the oxygen to produce energy and I think everybody knows this. And if this is not possible, of course, the lung itself suffers first. And when the lung suffers, there's no uh, replacement of the old and dying cells. Fungal infections have the possibility to come in and to feed on those uh, and this dead or dying organic matter. And this condition is called PCP. And that's a fungal infection. That's not a protozoan uh, or bacterial infection, which is waiting inside the body till the immune system is, is, is going to go down. You know how you give pneumocystis to a rat if you want to? Put him on a low-protein diet and give him some steroids for about six weeks and he'll get, he'll get pneumocystis. These guys are doing that same thing. Low-protein diet and a lot of steroids. I mean, all kinds of steroids. And that's the known way. I mean, that's, that's what the people that study pneumocystis, that's the way they produce a rat model for pneumocystis. What we see and this is uh, consistent in all industrialized countries, United States, Europe. 60% have fungal infections, 20% have cancer. And the rest are some rare forms of unicellular organisms. Of course, in the beginning they thought a lot of bacterial infections would show up. So they added the bacterial infections inside the definition of AIDS, but then they have to take them out because they didn't show up. And, and why should uh, established diseases should form a new syndrome? We know the conditions why somebody comes down with fungal infections and of course we know the treatment options to help the body to, to, to regenerate, to produce uh, its, the, the, the needed energy, right? Babies who are born out of, uh, with AIDS are babies who are exposed during pregnancy to different immunological stressors. In Africa or in the Caribbean, in Haiti and Trinidad and Tobago, Babies who are born of AIDS are born because their mothers are exposed to malnutrition during pregnancy. And babies who are born with AIDS in America or in Europe are because the mothers are exposed to chemicals or drugs of use or, the, or, or industrial chemicals. But why never before babies were having AIDS? Because toxins were there before, a lot of toxins. I think that the thing is a, is a, is a problem of, of a dosage, of amount. I think never before the human being has been exposed to the amount of stress that we have been exposed in the last three or four decades. So never before the babies were exposed during pregnancy of the mothers to the amount of stress that they are exposed nowadays. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that all babies are born nowadays a little bit, a little weaker than they were born 100 years ago. And some of them, whose mother are exposed to higher amount of steroids during pregnancy are shown these new conditions. Professor Duisberg proposed that it is not this relatively harmless retrovirus, the HIV virus, that could be causing all of this death and disease. Instead, it was recreational drug use. By examining this subculture of the underground fast-track gay community, as well as intravenous drug users within the heterosexual community were the ones who were 
being diagnosed with AIDS or suffering from the AIDS-related illnesses. The third of all American AIDS patients, of the 600,000 American AIDS patients, are intravenous drug cases. All the heterosexual AIDS patients, even the babies with AIDS, are in this category. Well, the babies have not injected drugs, but their mothers did. 200,000 American mothers are injecting drugs every year. And they are the mothers of the thousand or so AIDS babies that we have in this country. What is the evidence that drugs are really responsible for the AIDS-defining diseases in the United States and Europe? Well, there is some direct evidence. The nitrites, the uh, so-called poppers, uh, are responsible for the, the Kaposi sarcoma that is exclusively seen in gay men, at least 98% of it is. And 100% of these men have a history of inhaling these poppers. The nitrites are directly immune suppressive. That is documented in the scientific literature. They're some of the most potent carcinogens and mutagens known. This continues to be confirmed in large cohort studies of male homosexuals at risk for AIDS that they use these drugs to this very day. And it should go on to this date. Why do I say that? Because the medical orthodoxy the virologists, the doctors treating AIDS patients, the scientific community does not accept the view that drugs could cause anything, that the drugs would cause the damage is not acceptable hypothesis in America and in Europe these days. You are supposed to think that only a virus could do harm. Drugs are harmless. And in the world's most popular scientific journal of all, Science, an article appeared on the same question, which in fact said in 1994 that heroin is a pleasantly untoxic drug. The only trouble could be that you might, because you're high, forget to wear a condom and forget to use a clean needle, and then you get infected by HIV. It said that in the same year in which 3,500 fellow Americans died from heroin use, 3,500 and 60,000 spent up to a week in hospitals for heroin caused diseases. That is to say, the leading scientific journal doesn't even check the statistics that come out from the National Institute of Drug Abuse or from the White House on the health effects of heroin use. They're totally unaware of it. Drug abusers, who some of them live under persistent stress, or they get dirty street drugs, and which immediately would uh, damage the liver or destroy the liver, so they have hepatitis as well, the drug abusers. Yeah? We, <laughs> we don't need viruses to explain hepatitis inflammation. <laughs> you know, alcohol, poisons, yeah? and, and wrong malnutrition, you know. Uh, Everything is causing the liver to suffer. When people have a, 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 a history of hepatitis, most likely they are positive in the HIV antibody test, or put it uh, other way around. I never found a, a person testing positive who had no problems with its liver, because the liver has a lot of regenerative power, means a lot of decay of cells when being absolutely uh, intoxicated, but that means a lot of cells inside your body. And if immune functions are suppressed, then uh, antibodies are produced against your own proteins. We knew that hemophilias were getting more and more infectious, more and more tumors in the late 70s, early 70s until the early 80s. So we knew that something was going on in, in hemophilias. So the, new, the question in hemophilia was, what is causing this immune deficiency in hemophilias? And I think what was causing the, the new things in hemophilias were the way we were treating them. All of them had hepatitis. That means the inflammation of, of the liver. And uh, they have such a lot of, of problems because it was a big business selling uh, uh, clothing factors every day. But this destroyed uh, the hemophiliacs. This caused harm to them uh, to a great, great extent. And uh, when AIDS came up, uh, it was an ideal thing to wash their hands and blame it on a new virus which has been transmitted what they have overseen, and that's a real catastrophe for all chronic disease, where the energy is produced inside our cells. 
these bacteria are so stable integrated inside the cell that a great deal of their own genetic material has been exported inside the nucleus where there is protection of the genetic material better than in the bacteria themselves but they have their own genetic material that has been overseen and now think about the antibiotics killing bacteria they are killing our own energy plants inside the cell and if the cell is not able to produce enough energy, it might die. So you go into persistent inflammatory conditions if the body has enough re regeneration power to build up new cells, or the cell uh, becomes cancerous using fermentation as its source of energy. And in the liver cells, we have uh, most of the mitochondria present, 500 per cell. So that's the highest concentration of mitochondria. Of course, in egg cells of the women, we have 500,000. And therefore, AIDS is of greatest importance for women due to completely different reasons. Because with every shot, with unnecessary shot of antibiotica, they would destroy their genetic material, which they would pass over to the offspring. Because the mitochondria are only given to the next generation uh, through the egg cell. We have to switch our thinking from antibiosis which means if you are hurt by a microbe, kill the microbe and, and many times kill the patient too. But we have to go back to symbiosis from antibiosis to live in peace with our microbes. If you think about time in terms of evolutionary time and you see the population of humans growing like it has, the chances of you getting a human virus today are a hell of a lot higher than they were, say, 10,000 years ago. And it goes up in a, in a funny way. Let's just say that there are an infinite number of retroviruses in the, the world because they're changing so fast you couldn't really count them. And as more and more people are in your life, you get more and more chances of getting retroviruses. Now, they all might be harmless. The chances are good that they are because they're just barely alive. But if you hang out with a thousand people a year in a way that would maybe get, allow you to get some or most of their retroviruses, and they hang out with a thousand people a year, and they hang out with a thousand people a year, you're hanging out with a fourth of the human race. You're getting all the retroviruses from all over the planet. Now, it might be that none of those things by themselves are going to hurt you, but we know that some of them do grow in your immune cells. Right? And they come in, they come in at very low multiplicity. You don't make an immune response every time you get a retrovirus inside of you somewhere. But if you have a cell in your immune system that has a retrovirus in it, and you promote that to clonality because it's going to be a part of an immune response, that cell, then the retrovirus will definitely escape. It will flower in a sense, and it will then have to be dealt with by the immune system because there'll be enough of it showing in the blood that the immune system will go for it. Well, now, if you've got enough harmless but different retroviruses in your immune cells such that every time you may mount a new immune response, which means you probably take about 500 different immune cells and make a million copies out of each one of them, if you've got enough retroviruses in your immune system such that one of those 500 is going to have a retrovirus in it that you've never made an immune response to before, you're going to have to make an immune response to it this time because it will. if you make a million copies of the cell, it's sure to the retrovirus is certain to, to, to flower, to like make infectious bodies, right? Then you have to make another immune response, right? It used to call it a chain reaction. Please come back next week and we'll continue our journey on deconstructing the myth of AIDS. I'm Gary Nall. Thank you very much for watching.